Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fries from Central New Mexico Community College. We're starting here with video E on the blood vessels with a focus on blood vessel physiology. We're going to particularly discuss blood pressure at length in the next few videos. For a good portion of this class, not just in the cardiovascular system, we will talk at length about blood pressure. And in the future, when you take good care of your patients, blood pressure is going to be an important vital sign for you to keep track of. There are many, many things that regulate blood pressure in our body. There are many, many things that cause changes in our blood pressure. And so let's make sure that we understand the definition for blood pressure and other definitions that go along with blood pressure. So first of all, blood pressure is expressed in a unit uh, referred to as millimeters of mercury. And this right here is your definition for blood pressure. So blood pressure is equal to the flow of our blood, F for flow of our blood, multiplied by the peripheral resistance. Sometimes we, we might abbreviate peripheral resistance with just the R. Very important formula which we're going to incorporate eventually with the formula for cardiac output as well. Now, what exactly is blood pressure? Well, it's the amount of force that our blood puts up against the blood vessel wall on the inside. And of course, what creates that force is the resistance to stretch of that blood vessel wall. So the more, the more resistance there is to distending uh, in response to the amount of blood present in the blood vessel, um, the more resistance there is and therefore the blood pressure is going to increase as a result. When we discuss blood pressure and we don't specify the type of blood pressure, typically we're going to assume we're talking about systemic arterial blood pressure. So most often than not, we're talking about systemic arterial blood pressure. But as we will see, we are also going to need to discuss blood pressure in our capillaries and in our venous system. When we are really needing to discuss or specify those blood pressures, we'll always make sure that we define them or specify them as such, meaning capillary blood pressure venous blood pressure. Now we can't really discuss blood pressure without also discussing blood flow. And when we talk blood flow, we need to remind ourselves that blood can only flow from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. So it's very dependent on pressure gradient. So the definition for blood flow is literally the amount of blood that can flow through a certain area, but per unit time. So notice that we're adding per unit time. And typically, not always, but typically we express it in millimeter, milliliters per minute. And we abbreviate it with the letter F. So since we need a pressure gradient in a particular area, we're going to look at the difference in, in pressure perhaps at the start of the region and then at the end of the region. So that gives us our uh, difference in blood pressure. And that must then be divided by the amount of resistance that is present because clearly, depending on the amount of uh, vasoconstriction or vasodilation, for instance, which would be one reason for there to be peripheral resistance, the blood is going to flow better or less better. Now notice what it says here. We can also refer to blood flow in the whole body. So our specific region is now going to be the whole body rather than perhaps a small region uh, within your legs where we're determining blood flow. If we look at blood flow in the entire body, then blood flow is actually equal to cardiac output. And we will often look at blood flow as in the whole body. And once again, be sure that you understand then that we're talking about cardiac output. And so if we then replace in this formula, 
blood flow with cardiac output, assuming we're talking about the whole body, we come up with the following formula, very important formula, which says that blood pressure equals cardiac output times peripheral resistance, keeping in mind that cardiac output reflects blood flow in the whole body. And of course, cardiac output on average is about 5 liters per minute. So now we're expressing it in liters usually, or you could say about 5,000 uh, uh, milliliters per minute. We've already mentioned peripheral resistance, but to, to define it better, it's really anything and everything that's going to make it harder for the blood to flow smoothly in the vessels. And the major reason for why peripheral resistance will increase is vasoconstriction. But there are many other factors that can impact peripheral resistance as we will study here in future videos. Peripheral resistance is typically going to be the lowest in our largest arteries because they have such a large lumen. And it's going to be highest in our smaller arterioles because they have a smaller lumen and they have they depend on their tunic and media smooth muscle tissue for the vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So as I mentioned before almost always when we talk about blood pressure and we just use the term blood pressure we typically mean arterial blood pressure but we also see blood pressure in the capillary beds as well as in the venous system. Keep in mind that by the time we get to the atria in the heart, the pressure ought to be very low to almost zero. Otherwise, the blood would not be able to follow its pressure gradient. Literally, the blood should be almost falling into the heart with the help of the superior and inferior vena cavi. Let's focus first on arterial blood pressure. Arterial blood pressure is different from capillary and venous blood pressure in that it is pulsatile. And we will see on a graph how that pulsatile nature or the throbbing nature of our arterial blood pressure uh, can be represented. This throbbing represents the fact that our heart contracts and relaxes. And so we're going to be talking about systolic and diastolic blood pressure. When your blood pressure is measured, you always get two numbers. The top number is always your highest number. The second number is always your lower number. And these two numbers represent systolic and diastolic blood pressure. On average, we see that the systolic blood pressure should be around 120. Remember your units, millimeters of mercury, which I have not included here to save some space. On average, the diastolic blood pressure is going to be around 80 millimeters of mercury. It's important for us to try to measure blood pressure as close to the heart as possible so that these numbers reflect the amount of pressure the blood is ejected with. Um, of course, that's not always possible and understand that the further away we get from the heart, the lower the blood pressure in the arteries will be. Now, what impacts the blood pressure in the arteries is of course going to be how compliant the elastic arteries are. In other words, how well can they distend and um, how much blood can be pumped into those arteries by means of the heart. Now notice that I refer to the elastic arteries as auxiliary pumps because after they distend, after they have been compliant essentially, because they are so elastic they can also recoil and it's the recoiling effect that allows for the blood to be pushed forward. So they literally act as secondary pumps to the heart, the heart being the primary pump. And another way of referring to a pump mechanism, mechanism uh, 
such as the elastic arteries, that help out a primary pump mechanism, of course the heart, we can use the term auxiliary. Not to be confused with axillary, spelled very differently, auxiliary pumps help out. Because the arterial blood pressure is pulsatile, such that we have a higher and a low number, we can calculate pulse pressure, which is the difference between systolic and diastolic pressure. So 120 minus 80 is about 40 millimeters of mercury. And that gives us an idea of the actual working pressure that um, the blood depends on to be pushed through the circulation. We feel that particular pulse pressure as a pulse. So we will also talk about feeling pulses in different particular in different regions of the body in another slide. Finally, you will also need to learn about the mean arterial pressure, abbreviated as MAP. If you've ever seen a person hooked up onto a machine that keeps track of the vital signs, such as blood pressure, heart rate, etc., you're going to see a number on there that is identified as MAP. Again, it stands for mean arterial pressure. It's not just um, a, a perfect average of the systolic and diastolic pressure, because remember, as we get further away um, from the heart, we're going to see that the blood pressure drops. So we're going to have to depend on this formula. We're going to add the diastolic blood pressure to a third of the pulse pressure. And that gives us the single number of approximately 90, 93, give or take a few millimeters of mercury. Maybe even up to almost about 100. So that's a nice single number that health professionals can quickly look at and get a feel for what the condition is of the patient blood pressure wise. Here then we see a pretty important graph. In this whole chapter on blood vessels, once again, graphs are going to be really important for you to understand. Let's take a look at the x-axis, and on the x-axis we see all the different types of blood vessels from the aorta to the elastic arteries, all the way down to the capillaries and eventually our veins. On the y-axis, on the other hand, we see our pressure expressed in millimeters of mercury. And if we then plot the blood pressure, the arterial blood pressure, we of course see that it's very pulsatile. And then we can delineate where our diastolic pressure is and our systolic pressure. With the help of our formula, then we can calculate our mean arterial pressure. So this single line, um, perhaps what I should do is accentuate it a bit. So the single line we see right here, let me choose a color that is not going to be very confusing, maybe yellow. So the single line here represents our mean arterial pressure. Okay, now remember what pulse pressure means. Pul pr pulse pressure refers to the difference in systolic and diastolic pressure. So we su subtract this number here from that number, and that results in our blood pulse pressure. Now notice that the pulsating nature of the blood pressure diminishes as we move further and further away from the heart to the point that it is completely gone. And that has to do with the fact that we have less and less elasticity. So initially we're dealing here with those elastic arteries that can distend and recoil and distend and recoil. But as we're moving into the muscular arteries and especially the arterioles, we're going to see that they have a much smaller lumen. And at that point in time, despite the fact that these vessels can easily still distend and recoil because they have a, 
a well-developed tunica media, their lumens are so much smaller that we're going to see resistance increasing. And that's going to also, by the way, impact our uh, blood pressure in general. So as we get further and further away from the, the, the heart, we're going to see that our MAP also decreases. And by the time the vena cava reach the atria, we have a blood pressure of zero. The drop in blood pressure in the bigger arteries is not that steep. Notice that this goes pretty slowly. And of course, that has to do with their big lumen, less friction, therefore less resistance. And then once we get to those arterioles, very rapid drop. So let's take a look at capillary blood pressure. If you look at the graph here, the capillary blood pressure is illustrated in the purple region. Notice that the capillary blood pressure is still higher than the venous blood pressure, which makes sense because we need to maintain a pressure gradient to get the blood back to the heart. But the pressure in those capillaries is relatively low. In the systemic capillaries, the pressure ranges from about 40 to 20, depending on what end of the capillary bed we are. And this is important because remember, we don't want to blow out those capillary beds. They're really fragile, those capillary walls. And um, capillaries in general, whether they are the continuous capillaries all the way to the sinusoids, are by nature very permeable to begin with. So we really don't need uh, blood to arrive with this high force, with this high pressure to maintain gas exchange and to maintain nutrient and waste exchange. Let's take a look now at venous blood pressure, which is illustrated in the blue here. And we see a continuous drop in our mean arterial pressure and a rapid drop in the vena cava. So initially we see this continuous drop in our blood pressure in the veins because of the cumulative, cumulative effects of the peripheral resistance, which dissipates the blood pressure more in the form of heat um, and, and compliance. But we also need to pay attention to the fact that by the time we get to the vena cava, the lumens of the vena cava are so large that at that time we have very little resistance and um, very good compliance. And consequently, our blood pressure goes down to almost zero right before we get to the atria where the blood pressure should be zero to maintain a pressure gradient between the veins and the heart. We just learned that venous blood pressure is extremely low and very, very low in the vena cava before they return the blood to the heart. So how does that blood manage to fight gravity, particularly when it moves, has to move up the inferior vena cava to make it back to the right atrium? Well, there are some mechanisms. And the two primary mechanisms are listed here as the skeletal muscle pump and the respiratory pump. The skeletal muscle pump refers to the fact that by us using our skeletal muscles, we can literally squeeze the blood back to the heart. And the valves help with that. I'll get to that in just a moment. Also, our breathing, our regular breathing, our inspirations and expirations, and inspirations and expirations all the time are going to also impact how well the blood gets back to the heart. And we could even add to that the movement of all the digestive structures that we find in our abdomen. Finally, when the sympathetic nervous system kicks in, for instance, when we start to work out and it's important for us to have a good venous return, we're actually going to see some venoconstriction occur as well helping with the return of the blood. Let's take a look now at the importance of our valves in uh, our legs, for instance. Valves are really just extensions of the endothelium. And here we see two valves that are closed, while in this picture we see that one valve is closed and this valve is open. So if we're focusing, let's say, on the calf muscles, 
what happens is that blood gets collected in between two closed valves when our muscles are relaxed. And when we contract our muscles, the squeezing of the muscles up against our vein will push open the superior valve, literally pushing the blood in the next section that sits in between valves. And as enough blood accumulates in the next section, that blood will eventually cause this valve to close. And so by the alternate contraction relaxation of our skeletal muscles, we can force the blood to kind of climb up a ladder. And of course, this is with the help of our skeletal muscle pump and the valves. Now you've heard of people suffering from varicose veins, and that has to do with the malfunctioning of the, or the wearing out of the valves, often due to the fact that a person stands a whole lot to where these valves get stretched. In some cases, varicose veins are extremely painful, particularly when these valves in our deeper veins start to fail. It can also be an inherited condition, by the way. We learned earlier about pulse pressure, which is the difference between systolic and diastolic pressure. Well, that pulse pressure literally creates a pressure wave, which uh, results in the distension and the recoiling of the arteries, and we can measure this. So we have, or we can feel for, for this pulse, and there are different pressure points. Most often, we're going to be um, taking a person's or a patient's pulse at the level of the radial artery, maybe sometimes at the level of the uh, common carotid artery, but notice that there are many other locations. You know, depending on the condition of your patient, perhaps the positioning of your patient, um, what disease your patient is suffering from, injury to your patient, you may not be able to take a radial artery and you may have to depend on a very different location. I'd like for you to be familiar with these different locations.